Welcome back to my channel. My name is Brian Kafaki, and we're continuing a training series on Master Azure Databricks and Apache Spark, a sort of parallel training because they're very much the same in so many ways. In this lesson, we're continuing with Spark SQL, and we're going to be discussing a subset of SQL statements known as Data Definition Language, DDL. Let's jump in. What is SQL data definition language, you ask? These are the statements that create, modify, drop, or query database objects. And these include objects like database tables, views, and properties. Now, properties are not normally something you would think of when you're thinking of relational databases and DDL. But in Databricks, they are. And there are some differences in how we use DDL with Spark then, and I'm going to just use Spark and Databricks interchangeably, because when we talk about SQL, it's SQL, and there really is probably no differences between Databricks and Spark, except for maybe some nuances here and there, and I can't even think of any, so what I talk about here is applicable equally to Spark and Databricks. There's also something that's unique to scale out, which is creating, dropping, and changing partitions. Partitions are the sort of chunking by which the data is split up so that it will go to different nodes on a cluster. When we save data in tables, we can save it so that it keeps those chunks in uh, together so that when we reload it, it's faster, basically. We're not going to get too heavily into that. I'll just touch on it. But Spark SQL supports DDL statements so that you can also control how the data is saved when it's partition, you know, saved partitioned-wise. First thing you're going to need to do is get to your Databricks workspace. Now you can be in three different cloud environments and get to Databricks. Google Cloud just added Databricks to their cloud space. AWS has uh, Databricks as well. And of course, I'll be using Azure Databricks. So all three of them now support Databricks. You can also be using the community edition of Databricks to get it for free. But of course, some things won't apply like partitioning because it's a reduced version. Well, I'm gonna go here and launch my workspace and we covered in another video how to create your workspace. So take a look at that video if you need to. And what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to go right into a notebook that I created. When you um, want to load the notebook that I'm going to demonstrate, what you're going to want to do is go to workspace. You can navigate to where you are users wise, or you can just go wherever you want really in the workspace and say import. And then you're going to say browse. And then you're just going to find the notebook. I don't have the specific one in this list, but you'd find the notebook, say open, and then just say import, and it'll be there. And now you can work with that notebook. Just open it and you're good to go. I'm going to cancel this because I really don't want to have yet another copy of a notebook. So here, when you do get into your Databricks workspace, you start at this top area and you can find recent things you've worked with. I'm going to click on this one. This is what I've been practicing with prior to doing this video. In this notebook, and I'll put a link in the description so you can get the slides. For, well, there's really no slides, two slides, right? Uh, but you'll get the notebook itself, which you can import. Databricks notebooks have an extension of DBC, Databricks Compressed, I believe is what that stands for. And so it's like a little zip file. You can have many or one or whatever number of notebooks all within it, and you can just import it the way I just showed you. So let's take a look at what we want to do here. We're going to start by creating a database. Now, once the database is created, I'll get an error if I try the statement, but I'm going to say create database MyDB. Okay, since we got the OK statement, it worked great. You may be wondering, how did I execute the statement? The way we can execute statements in a notebook is by clicking on this little run button, and you can just say run the cell. So that's one. I'm going to run the statement show databases, and you can see it worked. Or I can, in the cell, just press control, control key, and enter. And control enter runs a statement, runs the cell, but it doesn't advance to the next cell. But if I hit shift, I'm going to do this now, shift enter, it runs the statement, and then it advances to the next cell. If you're not sure what all the different keyboard shortcuts are, you can go to this little menu option here and bring it up, and it tells you the different uh, uh, keyboard shortcuts. Those are the ones I use the most because I hate always going to the GUI. It's a bit slow to just pop around like that. All right, so now we saw that we can create a database and I use show database to be able to see what databases there are. And there's a bit of a pattern here. When we want to create something, we typically say create. 
we want to see something. This is not normal SQL, mind you. This is a Spark specific thing, but we will say show, like show databases, show tables. Okay, so let's go down here. And one other thing I did want to mention is that these are not databases in the standard way we think. In a relational database system, when you create a database, it's actually creating like an umbrella by which it's going to store objects. And it's got a lot more to it. It's got security things around it and a lot of properties and things within the system to manage a database, including transaction logs and everything else. In Spark, when we create a database, it's really like a namespace. Think of it more like a folder in which we're just going to put things. And it just allows us to create tables that have the same name in different databases. So it's a way to separate things and organize things. And that's really about all it's getting us. Okay. So here we want to say describe the database. So I'm going to do control enter. And we can see here's the database name. You can add something called a comment. Where is it stored? So it's actually stored in uh, under Hive. And this is where the really more the description of these things are stored. So it's just where the database is and, they, and the owner is root. Now, I can do describe, but if I add the word extended, I'll get one extra thing in the database when I'm describing, which is these properties, which we can create. These are name value pairs, things we can use to sort of provide extra information just for our own use. They're not necessary, but it's kind of a handy thing to do. So for instance, maybe I want to mark a database. And by the way, in a normal relational database system, you can have many databases under what they call one database instance or server instance. So typically, if you install SQL Server, you've got the server running, and you could, it could be localhost, or it could be X instance. And under that, you can have any number of databases. So kind of a different hierarchy there. So here I'm going to say describe database extended. I don't know if I ran this yet. So let me check, run this statement to set properties production equal true. And then I'll describe it with extended. And we can see production equal true. The value of having something like that is just what it looks like. I could mark a database and say, this is production. Don't mess with it. This is development, this Q&A. I can put cost centers on it. I can put really any kind of documentation and properties I want. So it's kind of a handy thing. Here I'm going to do the same thing, but instead of at a database level, I'm going to do it on a table. So I'm going to create a table. And here I'm creating the table. This is very standard kind of SQL syntax. Name, string, age is an int. City is a string. Oops, I want to do that. Um, if I can control Z, control Z, by the way, will undo. Good thing to know. Uh, and then table properties. I'm going to create uh, created by user property, uh, created date property, run this. And if I look at the table properties, uh, you don't actually see the properties I created. So I'm going to have to do uh, show table property. Oh, sorry. Show table properties here will show you the properties that I entered. And if I want to just see one table property, I can just pass that in as a parameter with parentheses, and I don't have to see all of them. So this one's just the created by user property. If I say describe table extended, then I get a lot of things around the table, uh, including properties here, but a bunch of other things like where is the database stored, format, etc. So you get a lot of information. Another thing I can do is I can change tables. Again, DDL is all about changing objects or creating them. Here I'm going to change the name of my table, my table, to my table 2 by just saying alter table, rename 2. So that's a fairly relatively standard syntax, I guess. Renaming tables can vary depending on particular uh, database implementations. But that doesn't look too unusual. Some of the other syntax, like properties, is not something you would typically see in a database system. Here we're going to say alter table, add columns. And we're going to add these two columns, title with the string format and date of birth, DOB, with a timestamp. And this is to the renamed table, my table 2. We describe it, and we can see it's got our new tables, our right, new columns, I should say. We can also alter the table and say we're going to alter a column, and we're going to add a comment to it. So the idea I'm trying to convey here is alter is typically used to modify things. In this case, we're modifying a table, and we're just going to put a comment on the city column. We're going to leave the column itself alone, just add a comment to it. And if I describe the table now, you can see that it's saying, oh, the city is the address city. So 
not a very helpful comment, but gives you the idea, right? Here I'm going to say alter the table. I'm going to set table properties. And I want to say that the it's sensitive data is equal to false. So maybe this is like you're in a hospital or something and you want to be able to indicate that this table does not include any personal identifying information. So I'm going to do control enter. And when I go and run it, just to look at it, you can see that um, if I scroll down, the table properties are here and we can see things going on, but here we can see sensitive equal false. So we can see the previously created properties, but now we have an extra one, sensitive equal false. We're not going to get into partitions here, but what partitions are referring to is when you distribute data on a cluster, you typically break it up by some value, some column. For instance, and you want to usually make it sort of a relatively even distribution. So when you partition, you might say, we're going to separate our sales data by month, and each node will contain a different month of sales. And that's great. But when you save the data, if you wanted to make it a table and persist it so that you could load it again easily later, <laughs> I think my Boston accent came out there, but later on you could then reload it back to the node and it would keep that partitioning intact so that it would be easy for it to break it apart and reload it. That's partitions. That's how it can actually uh, show partitions and you can maintain them with DDL, which again is not typical of a SQL database because relational databases don't normally support partitioning at least not partitioning across multiple machines and nodes. So here we see that it's not allowing me to do this because in this case, my table two is not partitioned. That's because I haven't done any extra work to partition the table or anything. But if I had, uh, then it would show me what the partitions are. The only takeaway there is as we get deeper into this, we're gonna wanna take a look at partitioning and how to support it better because managing partitions and how they data is distributed can have a huge impact on performance. All right, so let's take a look. We want to see what databases do I have. So we can do show databases. You can see a bunch of them, namely the one we just created and a few other ones there as well. We can say show table properties. I think we did this already, but I'll do it again. Show table properties, the two, and we can see the new sensitive data and as well as the other properties. We can also do something that's kind of interesting, which we can say is, Show me the create table statement. When we create a table, you see it's create, all the columns, etc. I hate typing code. So sometimes it's handy to be able to say, just give me the create table statement. And what you can see is that I could just swipe this and then cut and paste it into a cell and I could create a new table, just change the table name and I can replicate the structure of a table. So it's kind of an easy way to just do that, just to copy a table structure or just look at what the table's makeup is, what are the columns and types. Finally, I'm gonna show functions. Functions really don't apply here and we're not gonna be covering them much, uh, but this shows you functions within the database and things that, all kinds of things going on. This is, uh, it's, it appears to be beyond what you would typically see if you were looking at functions in say a, a relational database, but a similar idea, it's showing you a lot of different functions related to Spark. The last thing I want to show you is, okay, now that we've created these objects, let's get rid of them. Well, I created a database, so let's see what's in my database. Use MyDB. Now, we were already in here. I don't know if I said this already, but use MyDB means switch context. As I mentioned, when we're on a server, a database instance, there can be many databases. And when you start referring to tables, if you don't want to have to always put at the beginning the name of the table dot, I mean, excuse me, the name of the database dot table name, you can uh, execute the use statement, use database name as we're doing here, and it just changes the context to that database. And all statements after that are going to be assumed to be for that database. It's kind of like changing directory if you're in a shell where you say CD folder and then you do DIR and stuff and it shows up there. So here I'm saying switch the context. Now we're already here because we already created this database, we've been in it but switch the context, show tables, and we go here and we can see my table two is there. I wanna drop the database, but watch what happens if I try to. Doesn't let me. Uh, it says invalid operation because there's tables there. So what I need to do here, I only have this one table. I'm gonna say drop the table if it exists. This is a handy sort of extension to a lot of the commands. We say create if exists or if not exists. 
in here we're saying drop table if exists so that if it if it doesn't exist you won't get an error from the statement this is important if you're running a notebook and you can run this as a job you don't want to really be getting errors out of something that you may know well maybe it doesn't exist but just in case drop it if it does so having the if exists keeps you from getting unnecessary errors so i'm going to run that statement and it says okay which means it did it uh, hopefully at least there shouldn't be any table there and now i should be able to drop the database as well okay so we cleaned up everything we've seen how to do all kinds of ddl and let's kind of review what we talked about we talked about using sql data definition statements and these are statements as we saw the create modify drop or query database objects so we saw a lot of different instances what kind of objects databases themselves which in Spark are really just sort of a namespace or like think of it like a folder heading, but it lets us sort of group tables. We can have the same table name in two different databases, and that's probably the biggest benefit, but it also lets us group things. This could be our accounting database. This can be finance. This one's operations. We have tables. That's what stores a data, views, and views, just like in a relational database, are going to be queries that um, queries on top of tables, so nothing too shocking there. And of course we have properties, which is a bit of an unusual thing. That's a Spark addition, I guess, which lets us create name value pairs, which we can assign to some objects like databases and tables. We talked very little about partitions, but the idea of a partition is that when you save data and you're working on a distributed architecture like Spark, and this is also applicable to MapReduce, the idea is that you wanna save the data in a way that's broken into the uh, chunks of data that would be used on each node. So if you had the data distributed, we'll say, we'll say by zip code, then each partition would hold a different zip code. And by persisting it that way, when you decide later you want to work with the data again, you can just pull it in and it will automatically distribute by the partitioning. So it knows how to do that. So it's really useful. And you can, when you create tables, you can identify and create partitions to go with that. That gets more into, though, instead of schema on read, that's getting more into like the delta lake and maintaining data a little like a relational database. We're not going to get into that quite yet, so I only touched on it so that you're aware there are SQL statements that deal with that. So that's about it. I hope you liked this. I hope it was useful. We're going to do a lot more stuff. We're going to get into queries and all kinds of cool stuff with SQL, and then we'll even do Python and all kinds of great stuff. So thank you. Please like, share, subscribe, leave comments. I'm glad to hear about those and see what you guys are thinking. That's out. Um, that's about it. Till next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together.